Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. I am hoping that uh, in, we can conclude this uh, message in this sermon. Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. We can all read together. Shall we read? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Shall we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we want to continue looking into the scriptures. Father, we pray that even as you gave skill and understanding to Daniel, may you grant us the skill this morning. We can't depend on our ability to read or to analyze things uh, by the language of man, for we realize that there's so much that is in your word beneath uh, the written words that we can see. So now, Lord, may you give us the skill to understand these prophetic words which were spoken hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But we are so thankful that the Holy Spirit is still as living today as he was then. So, Father, we want to surrender all to you as we pray the takeover in Jesus' name. We pray with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. The Lord richly bless you. You may be seated. Now, if you remember in the last uh, service, Daniel had been praying for the restoration of Jerusalem. And at this time, the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, is under the Babylonians. And this man of God has been praying and seeking the Lord, praying for the restoration. And when the angel comes, uh, he tells Daniel that... uh, 70 times 7 years are determined for your people. Now, if you remember, uh, in Daniel chapter 9 and in verse 2, Daniel had been studying the writings of Jeremiah the prophet. And you know that Jeremiah had prophesied that the Jews will be in Babylonian captivity for how many years? 70 years. And that is what Daniel's prayer was focused on. He was looking at those 70 years coming to their expiration so that the Jews can be liberated. What Daniel did not see is there was another longer span of time which would, be, uh, which would amount to 70 years but times 7. Okay, That's quite a long period of time. And so the angel says, well, there's still 70 times 7 years which is uh, a total of 490 years. Okay, now, in other Bible versions, like the King James Version, it says 70 weeks, which you, when you break it down, arithmetic-wise, you know that uh, uh, one week is seven days, okay? So 70 weeks is, would be 490 days, and which, if we translate into years, it still comes to 490 years. But other versions, like the NIV, um, they phrase that in a better way. It says uh, uh, 77s are determined you know, for your people. Now, what is of interest to us, and I believe even to Daniel, is when do these 490 years, when do they start? What is the starting point? And thankfully, the angel... Uh, gave an indication of when the 490 years would begin. And the angel says, from the time you hear a proclamation, a decree given, a decree for the liberation of Israel, for the liberation of the Jews, the time, the commandment, the decree, the proclamation is given. That's the beginning point of the 490 years. And again, we don't have to guess to say, oh, who is it that gave the proclamation? 
Because there is enough information in prophecy as to which person was foreordained to fulfill uh, to fulfill the part of giving a proclamation. When you read Ezra chapter 1, the Bible says, you know, a time came when Cyrus, in order to fulfill the word, which was given to who? Jeremiah. Now, you know that the prophecy of Daniel is very much connected with Jeremiah's prophecy, right? Because here you find Daniel is praying for the liberation of the Jews. On what is Daniel basing his prayer? On the prophecy of Jeremiah. Because Jeremiah had prophesied after 70 years, God will liberate the Jews. So now at the end of the 70 years of Jeremiah, so Jeremiah prophesies, he says after 70 years, um, the Jews will be liberated from the Babylonian captivity. And as Daniel is praying, desiring to see the fulfillment of that, the angel gives him a clue that there will be a proclamation that will mark the fulfillment of what Jeremiah had prophesied. That when you hear the proclamation is given, what kind of proclamation? In verse 25 of Daniel chapter 9, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to do what? To restore and to build Jerusalem. So when you hear a proclamation with regards liberating the Jews, it means this longer period, which is equal to 70 years like those of Jeremiah, but seven times. Now, you know that in Ezra chapter 1, the Bible says, in order to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah, in order that the word given to Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord steered up the spirit of who? Cyrus. And what did Cyrus do? He gave a proclamation telling the Jews, let everyone go and start rebuilding, you know, uh, 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 Jerusalem. If we can quickly read that, if you don't mind. Let us go to Ezra. Wow. Where is that? All right. Yes, Ezra chapter 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Which word is that? It is the expiration of the 70 years which Jeremiah had prophesied for the Jews to be liberated. The Lord steered up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. That he did what? He made a proclamation. Which proclamation is this? The same one Daniel was told that from the going forth of the command or the proclamation or the decree for the rebuilding of you know, Jerusalem. So he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he that charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because a lot of theologians, in using wrong timelines, they've picked on other characters to have given the decree. Among theologians who makes that blunder is... Uh, Miss Ellen G. White, you know, uh, uh, the, the prophetess that uh, the Adventists follow, they believe uh, she was uh, a prophetess, and, and this is what Ellen G. White says, yes, Cyrus gave the proclamation, but when Cyrus gave the proclamation, 
there's hardly any progress which was made in rebuilding uh, the temple. So there were other people who gave proclamations, which you can find in the book of Ezra. So, for example, Cyrus gave the decree. But you know that after Cyrus gave the decree, there was a lot of trouble for the Jews to start doing the rebuilding works. Okay, you can find that in, um, uh, in chapter 4 of Ezra. Verse 3, But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Hath what? Hath what? Now, you see, that uh, ties in very well with the prophecy in Daniel from the going forth of the commandment. Okay, so now, I, I love the same usage of the word commanded us. Now, now notice this thing. Um, verse 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and did what? Troubled them in building. You know, there was so much trouble that there are these, in verse 5, hired counselors. And hired counselors against them to frustrate their papers all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So later on, another king rose. And he had to give another decree. You can review it. Until we have another one called Atexas Longimanus. So when Atexas Longimanus gave a decree, it is at that point that there was significant progress in the construction works. And so, Ellen G. White prefers to pick the date for Atexas Longimanus as the starting point of the decree, which I think is 445 BC. Well, which a lot of people in the message also are using. Simply because that's the date Brother Branham used. Now, of course, Brother Branham did a lot of reading. He, led, uh, he read uh, what the Adventists said. He, he read what the Baptists are saying. Well, just like any Bible student, there's certain information you use from studying other sources. That doesn't mean you are not inspired. It simply means you're a Bible student who reads widely. Now, in using certain sources, you may use those which are not accurate. But the main thought of how Brother Branham brings out the 70 weeks was a very correct picture. The argument is on the dates used. Now, when you pick 445, there's a lot of tweaking you need to do to the timings. For example, what a lot of people have done is, instead of using a 365-day calendar, They resort to using 360 days, calling it a prophetic calendar. You know, because of certain scriptures, you know, like 1,260 days. So they would make every month to have 30 days. Now, there is no such a thing as a prophetic calendar. If God is going to tell you that, <clears throat> uh, thus saith the Lord, Brother Jesse, next week on Thursday, or on 25th of February, this and that is going to happen. No, you're, you're not going to say, okay, let me see. I'm, I'm not going to use the Gregorian calendar because this was made by human beings. Uh, let me see. Let me go and uh, do some calculations on according to the prophetic calendar or the ones the Jews are using today. Which date will be 25th February according to the Jewish calendar? No. That is very illogical. If Daniel is using a certain calendar, <clears throat> and that is what Jews are using, and if it is a 365 uh, uh, year calendar, it is common sense for us to know that's the same language God is going to use to communicate to you, right? That should be simple enough, isn't it? Yeah, so now, the thing of it is, the Jews have always used a 365 day calendar. Okay, you can do a little study in uh, the history of calendars. 
Okay, so now, the thing of it is, we need to stick to the three, 365 day calendar. And we still need to keep in line with what Bible prophecy says, that it was Cyrus who was appointed to make the proclamation, not a Texas Longimanus. Because you find it again in Isaiah, right? In Isaiah it says, I'm raising my servant Cyrus to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That was way before Cyrus was born. His name was mentioned. So it will be a blunder of major proportions if we pick another person just for the sake of adjusting the time to fit in with the numbers we are using. So, I find the EE chart to be more reliable in its timing. So those who don't have the EE chart, I have a number of them. Let me see if uh, I have a copy. Oh, looks looks like I left uh, I left it. But I have a number of them. You you can use the E chart. You you can request for it later on and remind me. So now, with the E chart, we are starting with uh, 454 BC. Cyrus makes a proclamation. Now, again, going back to Miss Ellen G. White. Um, uh, was she Mrs. Mrs. All right, Mrs. Okay, we have a former Adventist there, so he's, he's, he, it's very reliable when he says Mrs. I, I believe that because he was an evangelist in the Adventist. Brother Tenzer. Right, now, so she was Mrs. White. So she prefers to pick a time when the trouble was over. When the Jews now could start rebuilding the works without much hindrance. But that is again a blunder. Because Daniel, he was told that from the time the commandment is given, the city is going to be rebuilt, but in troublous what? Times. And, well, you saw the trouble which uh, Ezra talks about. It says our works were frustrated, meaning it was part of the prophecy. The trouble was part of the prophecy. So you don't take it out in order to adjust your timing. Are you following me? So now, Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, notice, it does not say from the time the rebuilding shall begin. That's not what it says. It's from the time the commandment is given, whether the works starts or they don't start. Is that making sense? From the going forth of the commandment. Unto what? Messiah the Prince. Now, which is 30 AD? You have Messiah the, the Prince. Again, here. What some theologians prefer to do is uh, they pick, la, uh, I think Ivan Panin also, uh, he picks the date when uh, Messiah was born. Now, you don't just pick uh, the time Jesus was born to mean that is Messiah the Prince. Because you need to understand the context of Messiah the Prince until Messiah the Prince. Because as you read on, <clears throat> it mentions about Messiah being cut off. It says after three score and two weeks. Now remember, these are 69 weeks. From the time of the command to Messiah the Prince, it's 69 weeks. Now, but the way the angel spoke and phrased these words, he didn't mention 69 as in one figure, as 69 weeks. There are two demarcators which were spoken. What were the two demarcators? From the time of the commandment to Messiah the Prince shall be what? Seven weeks. He first mentioned seven weeks. And the other one is what? 62. 
And you know that seven weeks translated into years equals 49. Is it? Right? 49 years. And that's about the period that it took to build the temple. Now it says in the next verse, in verse 26, it says, and after three score and two weeks, which is 62, meaning after this second demarcator, what will happen? Shall Messiah be? So, that should be easy enough for you to know that when it mentions Messiah the Prince, we are looking at a time in the proximity when Messiah was killed. And there's only one time, one season which fits in correctly. That's the time when Jesus was proclaimed as a prince, as a king. Now, remember this sense. When Daniel gave this prophecy, there were other people who were round about his contemporaries. Tell me which prophets lived at the time when this was being fulfilled. You have Daniel? Tell me other prophets that you know. Zechariah and Haggai. Now, among these who prophesied that, behold, your king comes riding on a donkey lowly. Can we read that? Where is that? Uh-huh. So now, I want to bring to your attention the fact that when Daniel was having these visions, he was a prophet. But you need to know that there were other prophets. God was giving them revelations as well. And their messages were tying in together. Zechariah, he mentioned about a time is coming when the Messiah will ride on a donkey and proclaim the king. Daniel, his prophecy only mentioned the part until Messiah, the prince, when Messiah shall be presented as a prince. So God is giving them these revelations. Now, the thing of it is, when you go to Daniel, he says, Under, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself. Now I don't believe they really understood what they were prophesying about. But when you look at Zechariah, in his prophecy he gave even more details of how the Messiah will be cut off. I want you to see Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. Now, you need to keep your hand in Daniel because we'll keep referring to it. Zechariah 12, verse 10. I want us all to read when you are there. Shall we read? And I will pour upon the house of David... Can we all read together, please? Verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have what? Pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Let us read 13 verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Now notice, the other one we're just from reading, 12 verse 10, he says, He was what? He was pierced, right? Now, 13 verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds? Where? In thine 
in thine hands. Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my, of my friends. Can you see how Zechariah gives a detailed prophecy on how Messiah will be cut off? In verse 7, he even describes how the Messiah will be smitten and uh, the ship will scatter. Shall we read verse 7? Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the ship shall be scattered and I will turn my hand upon the, the little ones. You know that prophecy was referred to when the Lord was arrested, right? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Zechariah that smite the shepherd and the ship shall scatter. So now do you see that these prophets are living at the same time and their prophecy their prophecies are in context. They are speaking about the same things. Now look here. When you read Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, it says the street shall be built again and the war even in troublous times. You can find details of how this was fulfilled in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 11 to 12. 2 verse 11 to 12 and verse 19 to 20 and Zechariah chapter, I mean and Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 6. But here it says the rebuilding will happen in troublous times but you know the good thing is when the enemy comes in like a flood the Lord will be present to raise a standard. To help his people through that time of trouble. And how does the Lord help? He sends his word to strengthen you, to encourage you, to direct you, to lead you. And that is what God did in the time of Ezra. In the time of Zechariah and Nehemiah. You know, let us read uh, Ezra. We see how the Lord helped them. Ezra. Well, uh, the last time we read uh, chapter 4 verse 4 we saw the, the troubles they had but I want us to read chapter 5 in chapter 5 we see how the Lord helped them by raising two anointed ones then the prophets Haggai, the prophet, can we all read please? Then the prophets, Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shittel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. Which prophets are these? Huh? Can I hear you? Who are these prophets who are helping them? Zechariah and who? So when this temple was being built, the, there are these two prophets. They are the two anointed ones in the time when the temple is being rebuilt. They are giving prophecies. You can see their prophecies in Zechariah. Other prophecies, you can find them in the book of Haggai. They were telling the people, don't give up. This house shall be completed. The, the glory of the latter house shall be, you know. They, they spoke all those prophecies. Encouraging the administrator, Zerubbabel, and Joshua, the high priest. So th through their prophecies, encouragement is being given. You know, and that's how the Lord helped in all this. Now, here is something. 
the proclamation was given and then by the time you come to the time when Messiah the prince is cut off there is a prophecy which is given of what will happen after Messiah the prince is cut off now remember that the prophecy was for how long 70 weeks right but here it only moved up to how long? 69. So, when 483 years had expired, or 69 weeks, the temple was there. Herod's temple. By this time it was beautified. The same temple you have here, which they were constructing, but with time later on, these politicians come in, Herod, and they really beautified it. And that is why it was called Herod's Temple. They put nice stones around it. And you know, one day, the disciples are telling the Lord, Oh, look at how beautiful the temple looks. Because, you know, it was a very big treasure for the Israelites. Now, here is the Messiah. They are telling him, look how beautiful the temple is. Now remember, when God is dealing with the Jews, whenever he's dealing with the Jews, there has to be a temple in their midst. And the Lord gives an astonishing prophecy. He says, a time is coming when there won't be one stone upon another. All these beautiful stones you are seeing, there will be nowhere. In other words, the temple will be destroyed. It will be no more. That's quite astonishing. But if you read the prophecy of Daniel carefully, you find the prophecy of the Lord Jesus hidden right in the prophecy of Daniel. That something terrible is going to happen after Messiah the prince is cut off. Let us see what Daniel spoke about that. You find it in verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, meaning after this second marker, or to put it another way, after 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now let us read the next words together. And the people of the prince that shall come shall do what? Can I hear you please? Shall destroy the city and what? And the sanctuary. You see that? Do you see that? He says the people of the prince shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The sanctuary pointing to the temple. Now remember, the prophecy begins with there shall be a command to do what? To restore, build the city, build the temple and all that. But again it says after 69 weeks the city shall be destroyed again. The sanctuary, the temple shall be destroyed. So you see where the Lord Jesus, where his words are coming from? When he was telling those Jews, a time is coming, you won't see a stone upon another. This temple shall be destroyed. If they only understood the prophecy of Daniel, they would have understood what the Lord Jesus was speaking about. And the end therefore shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The Lord speaks of a war here. He speaks of desolations. Desolations means to make a place desolate, unrecognizable. And in these desolations, the prophecy of Daniel indicates that the city shall be destroyed, including the sanctuary, including the temple. Well, it is not something new. We all know that after the Lord Jesus was killed, of course, he resurrected later on. 
But after some years, from 30 AD, somewhere in 70 AD, okay, my timeline is not to scale. This looks too far. Let me put it here. In 70 AD, who knows what happened in 70 AD? Can someone tell me what happened in 70 AD? Brother Tenson? Speak louder. Yeah, Jerusalem was surrounded by Rome. Roman soldiers. And what happened? Now, remember, that time, you know, the Jews are desiring to be independent. And they're trying to rebel against Rome. And at that time, a prince was sent to go and quell this rebellion. Who was the Roman prince? Prince Titus. Prince Titus was sent to warn the Jews to stop their riotous behavior. But you know what the, the high priest at that time said? You can, you can read the details of the events which happened. They were written by an eyewitness, Josephus. You can read that. It's there on the internet. The, these historical events were narrated by an eyewitness of events that happened. You know, Prince Titus was trying to reason with the Jews to say, can you stop what you are doing? If you don't do that, you make us to desecrate your temple. With my armies, I'll march in and destroy the temple. But we're giving you time to stop what you're doing. But, but you know what the high priest was saying? This is the city of God. We shall not allow that to happen. God is on our side and blah, 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 blah. But there were those Jews who remembered what the Lord said. When you see Jerusalem is surrounded by the armies, when you see the abomination that maketh desolate, which was spoken by Daniel the prophet, do you remember what the Lord said? Let him who is on the housetop not come down. Run as you can. D don't be deceived to say no. You know, God is on our side. This is a holy place and all that. The Lord had warned about that. And history records it that a number of Christians fled to the mountains. Others were saying, no, we shall overcome. <laughs> hey, you need to move in the spirit. You need to know your time. You need to know when God is in this thing or God is not there. And I better heed to what the prophets have said. So, and it wasn't the intention. Now listen to this. It was not the intention of Titus to burn down Jerusalem. Titus had shown a lot of restraint. But you know what these Jewish soldiers were doing? They were provoking the Romans. Throwing stones. Until the situation went out of control. And it is actually the soldiers who started the burning down of the temple. Now you see the reason why the prophet says the people of the prince. The prophecy fulfilled right to the dot. So the people of the prince, they shall destroy the city. Now here it is. All these terrible events are happening after Messiah the prince is cut off. Now, the big question that arises is, these are supposed to be 70 weeks, right? But so far we've only covered 69 weeks. What has happened? Because at the end of the 69 weeks, when Messiah is cut off, the Jews reject the Messiah. And when they reject the Messiah, the apostles declare that the gospel has now gone to the Gentiles. Meaning God has stopped dealing with the Jews at this point. He goes to the nations of the world. 
You can find that in the book of Acts 13 verse 46. Shall we quickly read that? Acts 13 verse 46. Shall we all read? Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And when you read other portions of scripture, like in Romans chapter 11, may I say something here? There is a serious, terrible mistake theologians have made out of this. Among them, Jehovah Witnesses and Adventists. They believe we are the Jews now. We are the spiritual Jews. Because God turned away from the, these people who rejected so in their place, a Jew is no longer part of God's plan. And when you look at that erroneous thought and idea, it leads to another bigger, terrible mistake. To say there is no such a thing as a rapture. One mistake bleeds another. Listen to me, beloved ones. God turned away from the Jews here. But there are a lot of scriptures which tell us that a time is coming when he shall go back to them and he will turn away from us. And that period of time is called the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? A period of time when God takes a Gentile, a wild branch and grafts it into the olive tree. Oh, where do we get that? Let's read Romans chapter 11. It is God who blinded them so that his gospel can go to the Gentiles also. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us read 11 chapter, uh, chapter 1 of Romans. I mean chapter 11 of Romans verse 1. Romans chapter 11 verse 1. I say then hath God cast away his people. Now look at me. Paul is asking. Paul is asking, does it mean here after the Messiah, the prince was cut off and the Jews rejected the Messiah and Paul declared that you Jews have rejected the grace law, we turn to the Gentiles. Does it mean God has rejected his people? Does it mean God has forgotten the promise he made to Abraham? Remember Moses when God told him, I want to destroy all these people. And Moses said, if that's what you want to do, then kill me. Don't destroy these people. God was still patient. He still kept his covenant with his people. But here we see a terrible thing happens. When the Messiah, the Son of God, God manifests in flesh. They take him and crucify him on the cross. And Paul says, and Barnabas, law, we turn to the Gentiles. And here he says, does this mean God has cast away his people, the Jews? Romans 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am a, I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias? Now, I want us to skip that. I want us now to go to uh, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. 
for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, now, here is something wonderful that I love to read. Now, if the four of them be the riches of the world. Now, look here, saints. If the four of the Jews here. Because of the four of the Jews. It brought riches to the Gentiles. Of course, Pentecostals, the riches they see there is a Mercedes Benz, a big house. No. The riches of glory, of his word, the revelations of his word, the salvation. Praise the Lord. Amen. If the four of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now listen, you, you need to catch what Paul is speaking here. For I speak to you Gentiles, in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulate them which are my flesh, and might have some of them. For, now listen, for if the casting of them be the reconciling of the world. Look on the board here. At this point, God cast away the Jews. Now, he says, if God, by casting away the Jews, he brought in the Gentiles, he gave them salvation. What greater thing will happen if God accepts the Jews? By rejecting them, it has given us the riches of the gospel to know his word. To live a Christian life. Then what great thing is going to happen to us. When he accepts the Jews. Listen to this. Verse 15. Let us all read it. I want you to catch it. Let us all read it. I want to hear your voice. For if the casting away of them. Be the reconciling of the world. What shall the receiving of them be. But life from the dead. Wow. Wow. So, this is going to go on God working among the Gentiles. But when the time comes that he receives the Jews, it will be so great a blessing to us that the dead shall be raised. That speaks of the rapture. Alright? So, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So, when that great event happens, when there shall be a rapture, when there shall be a resurrection of the dead, you and I know God has gone back to the Jews. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So this thing is going to go on. And it is where now, whatever, listen to this, the rebuilding of the temple had started here, right? Which people were helping? Which two anointed ones? Zechariah and Haggai, right? They were prophesying, that saith the Lord. The Lord shall help you. You shall build this temple. God is among us. Now, all this good work which started here, it started progressing. Until here, Messiah the Prince was killed. Then whatever plans God had, whatever great plans, so to speak, were posed. God here pressed on pause. He turns away from the Jews. He goes to the Gentiles. He's been working among the Gentiles. Until we've reached a time when the Gentiles are actually rejecting Christ. They are crucifying him also. Look at the mess we've made out of the gospel. Oh, you think Gentiles are worshipping Jesus when they say Jesus? No, Gentiles are now worshipping idols. Gentiles are trashing on Jesus Christ. Yes, they mention Jesus with their lips. But everything about their life, the filthiness which has crept into the church, it is nothing looking like Jesus. 
the name of Jesus is actually blasphemed in the way people sing, in the way people dress, in the way people carry themselves, in the way the so-called pastors are stealing from the churches in the name of Christ. There's so much filthy happening until when God looks at the mess, it is a, an ugly stench in his nostrils. And we've embarrassed the name of Jesus before the world. A long time ago, you would know a Christian from afar, from the way a woman would dress. They dressed decently. Their hair was natural. They dressed long things. When you saw a godly brother, there was a clear distinction between people of the kingdom of God and people of the world. But today it is not so. Women enter the churches dressed so sexually, starting from a pastor's wife preaching on the altar in a tight trousers, painted lips. It's fornication happening in open daylight in the churches with the so called praise teams. It is filth. Abominable things happening. Preachers living luxurious lives. Telling people to give to God and they shall prosper. But people are not really giving to God. They are giving to feed the ugly, wildly appetite of these men called men of God. The word of God has been desecrated. On a Sunday people sing in a so-called praise team. In the night time, in the dark corners of the night, they are committing fornication. These things are happening in churches. A pastor looks holy on a Sunday. But he has a girlfriend. He fondles some girls. One scandal after another are happening in the so-called Christian churches. The name of the Lord has been mentioned in vain in the churches. And I tell you one thing. There's so much tongue speaking going on. And all the gibberish. But it's a curse which has fallen upon the so-called Christians. And you know what? The filth is coming up to the brim of the cup. And that is why you see all the nonsense about Siawan. Look at that Siawan guy. Oh. Did you see the time before they started calling him Satanist? They called him from one church to another. Go deeper, Papa. Go deeper, Papa. And well, I was watching one video. And these bishops and pastors, they were prophesying to see one. Oh, I had a dream that you are a true man of God. You are a servant of God. Another preacher takes on another microphone. You are a servant of God. I had a dream yesterday. That's the time when that guy came to Zambia. When he was going from one church to another. Go deeper, Papa. Go deeper, Papa. Uh-huh. He was going deeper into your souls, sowing rubbish. Why couldn't they discern it? Because people have gone after a gospel of prosperity. The true gospel has been thrown out of the church. The gospel where a preacher can tell people the right way to dress. If Sia one came to this church, right from his haircut, I don't even need to see any vision. I don't even need to see someone to tell me he had a dream. Just from his haircut, I'll know the pulpit has no place for such nonsense. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. We don't come to the house of God for entertainment. If a man stands here and he is truly prophesying, he won't put up a behavior and mannerism as though he is some star. Have you seen how these guys prophesy? Can I tell you a prophecy? And the whole thing is drawing attention to how great and powerful he is. When a man sees a vision, the presence of God is so strong and mighty. You will actually be trembling as you are giving your thus say the Lord. But all spirituality, all common spiritual decency has been lost in the church. 
until Enganga and the witch doctor can stand, as long as he shouts hallelujah and Jesus, people will be duped and deceived. Why? Discernment has been thrown out of the church. People are completely lost. They don't know what, what, how light looks like. Have you ever seen how nightclubs look like? In the nightclub, there is also what they call light. But it's not really light. It's an excuse for light. There is blue in it. There is yellow in it. And people will be dancing there. In those kind of lightings. Do you know why there is that kind of light? People will be fornicating in the nightclub. Someone who dressed so poorly. There will be what they call joy there. But that is not light. And there is so much nightclub light in the denominations. And people can dance and people can prophesy. But really, the true thing is, there is no true light. If true light was to be turned on, someone would take a stink and cover themselves up. Someone would realize, hey, I'm not supposed to look like this. If true light was to flash, a man fondling a woman would say, oh, there is light here. They will stop all the nonsense. But all these are signs which were spoken of in the scriptures. What did Peter prophesy? Let us go and read the prophecy of Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. What will these teachers do? Who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves, what do they bring upon themselves? Can I hear you say, they'll bring upon themselves? Swift destruction. Destroying their souls. Verse 2, shall we read? And many shall follow their pernicious ways. Do you understand what the word pernicious means? Pernicious means causing harm, but in a very slow way. Causing harm, destruction, but in a very slow way. This deception you are seeing in the charismatic churches, they haven't started today. It was a little compromise which was fed into the system. That, oh, it's all right for a sister to wear a, a trousers as long as it's not that bad. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I mean, they can put a, on a little, little wig. As long as the wig looks decent. Through their pernicious ways. Pernicious. Killing you slowly. It starts with one little compromise. You say no. A little wig starts alright. Another time. You won't see what the women will do to their hair. Another time. They will remove their eyebrows. They will say no. As long as it's my heart which matters. Before you realize it. The women will be insulting the image of God upon them. My dear African sister, when God created you with your natural hair, he did not make a mistake. But we saw the white woman and we made ourselves believe that straight hair looks beautiful. And so our women go into those saloons and heat up their heads and hair, trying to stretch it so that they can, it can look like a white man's hair. Well, it has been done over and over again until you don't realize that the underlying motivation is inferiority complex. Well, all these things are widespread. But it's one sign. What is the sign? Of, it is a sign of the prophecy Peter said. Many shall follow their pernicious ways. Did it say few? Did it say few? Many shall follow their pernicious ways. So, you say, well, Brother Piri, but you know, what you're speaking is, sounds strange. Not many churches follow it. Well, truth is not measured by how many people follow it. 
Because right from here it tells me, many shall follow their pernicious ways. So I don't mind having a small church which walks into the few who don't follow their pernicious ways. That's right. By reason of whom, now listen, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Stand in the food you and verse By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That's what is happening. When people see me preaching with my Bible, they'll say, You are men, you are Why? The name of God has been tarnished to evil. The name of pastors has been brought into ridicule because a majority are presenting a false gospel. The way of truth shall be evil spoken of. When Muslims look at Christians, when Muslims see the Christians, they say you are infidels. Look at the way your women dress. The way of truth shall be spoken of evil because of an abundance of evil teachers and preachers who are misleading the people. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words through what? Come on, can I hear you? Through covetousness and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Because of their covetousness. Do, do you know what covetousness is? Covetousness means having an appetite for wealth. Appetite to look good. Appetite to look nice. Appetite to also drive in a post car. Appetite to put on a latest suit. So because of their covetousness, because of their desires to look rich, they will make merchandise. They'll make a business out of you. It was written here. Because of their appetite to be rich, they'll make business out of you. They'll say you need to give tithe. You need to give to God. But at the bottom of it, it is because of their covetousness. That is why they dress a certain way. They have to look like a papa with a pointed shoe. They need to look smart in a latest suit, in a latest vehicle. Out of their covetousness. They'll make business out of you. And remember, they'll make the way of truth evil spoken of. And because of that, when people hear a preacher teaching on tithe, even when a God called man preaches on tithe, another person will say, no, he's just asking for money. The way of truth being evil spoken of because of deception. But well, people who are spiritual, they know what they need to do. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Dear friends, if you are in such a system, stay away from it. There is no truth there. There is no truth there. All these are signs that the times of the Gentiles are getting up. Our time is running out. God is about to go back to the Jews. Remember, so far 69 weeks have gone. There is one more week to make it 70 weeks. When rapture happens, denominations will keep on with their drama. But God will go back to the Jews. For one week, which is seven years. Which is seven years. Now, of course, there's a big confusion there in the message. As I want to conclude, what time is it? What time is it? 
All right. As I conclude. Now, there is a big confusion there. Some people believe, no, it's not seven years remaining. It's only three and a half years. And this is what, how they explain it. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. If you are there, say amen. I don't want to leave anyone behind here, so I want you to be there. Daniel 9, verse 27. Praise the Lord. If you are there, say amen. amen. Right. Now, let us all read together. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, he will confirm the covenant with many for how long? Now, this is the one week. He will confirm the covenant. Now, the question is, who is the he? You just need to read verse 26 to understand who is the he. So, if I can read that quickly so that you understand. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. The people of the the prince that shall come. So the one who confirms the covenant with for one week, it is the prince. Now who are those people? Those were the Romans, right? Now of course some people want to take the subject of Messiah shall be cut off. So there are people who take... The he in verse 27 is Messiah, who is mentioned in verse 26. Others, the category where I belong to, they say the he is, is someone who comes from this realm. And I have scripture to confirm that. Now, listen, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, meaning after three and a half years, he shall do what? What shall, he, what shall he do? In the midst of the week, he shall do what? Cause the sacrifice and what? The oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Make it. What is the it? This same person, he shall cause sacrifices to end. And then there will be so many abominations. And he shall cause the city of Jerusalem to become desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I'll dwell more on this in the next Sunday. But let me mention the thought I want to bring out. What is this covenant? Covenant. From what we have read, it is a covenant to do with the covenant of the Jews in giving sacrifices. All right? It's the covenant. You know that the law is called the covenant. All right? That is why at the beginning of the week, he confirms the covenant. To say the Jews can give their sacrifices and all these things. But in the middle of the week, something terrible happens. He causes the sacrifices, which Jews were happy to have resumed. The Jews are looking forward to that. But right now, because of the political problems, they can't do that. But we are told of something here, where their sacrifices will start. And this mighty man confirms the covenant. But in the middle of the week, he goes against what he confirmed, what he agreed with them. To give their rights to the temple. He does something abominable. Now you can't tell me that is the Lord Jesus doing that. Now here it is. Others say, they, this is what they say. Uh, this actually was fulfilled in the time of Jesus. They say Jesus, he ended the sacrifices because he himself became the sacrifice. Now Mrs. White, 
that can't be correct. You, you can read uh, The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. And Brother Branham, when he was teaching on the 70 weeks, the message titled 70 weeks of Daniel, he taught that was the Antichrist. But at another time, when answering a question on the seven seals, someone asked, is it seven years remaining or three and a half years remaining? And Brother Branham passed a comment to say, well, it is Christ, the first three and a half years were already fulfilled. Because Christ ended the sacrifice in the middle of the week. Meaning, three and a half years are remaining. So that caused the confusion. Where well, among people who follow Brother Branham, others follow what he taught earlier. In the message, seven weeks of Daniel. It took him a long time to teach that. In which he said, the he is the Antichrist here. Meaning, seven years are still remaining. They haven't been fulfilled. But when you read the seal's message, he was answering a question. And someone asked that question because in another place, again, Brother Branham seemed to have hinted to say it's three and a half years remaining. So actually, Brother Branham gave, gave two contradictory thoughts on that. One is seven years remaining. Others have gone to three and a half years remaining. Now, the other time someone called me, he has a ministry, they call it, say what the tape says, ministry. And he says, Brother Peter, I would love to see you. I would want us to meet at, um, where was that, Levy? Levy says, we need to meet there, you know. He felt like I need assistance. And the assistance is because many message fellowships have come together to give each other licenses. So even he also gathered up his own group to be giving out licenses, you know, <laughs> because of this thing the government requires. So he says, you know, us, we're coming up together, but we won't, we won't subject any fellowship to follow maybe what we follow or what another person follows, like what the other group is doing. But maybe we can have a little share in this. Okay, if you want to give me a license and no strings attached or for you to investigate my doctrines, why don't you go ahead and give me the license? Why do you want first to feed me with this with, with this rubbish of say what the tape says? So he says, okay, let us sit down. You know, we need to stick with the tape teaching. We only have to say what the tape says. Now there was Brother Nzima, there was Brother Master there. You were there, Brother Nzima? I said, okay, fine. If I have to say what the tape says. I said, brother, let's go to the tape. 70 weeks of Daniel. Brother Brown says seven years are remaining. Is that on the tape? He says, yes. Let's go to the seals. Brother Brown says three and a half years are remaining. Is, is that on the tape? Okay, so tell me which tape I have to pick. Hey, you saw how he wasted time? Uh, you know, brother, we, we, we need to stick with the tape. Fine! Tell me which tape I have to pick. If you have to tell me, we pick the one after the seals were revealed. Hmm. That's your own formula you fed into the tapes. I said, okay, fine. If we take that thought. Let's look at the first Elijah, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Let's pick one tape. Of John the Baptist. What did he say on that tape? He told his people. Behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. How many say amen to that tape? Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Let's say that tape is step one. Let's pick step two. Which was preached later on. In that tape. The prophet. Not Branham. John. The prophet says, he tells his disciples, can you go ask him, is he the one who is coming? Or we should look for another? So, that is step two. Which step will you believe? The one which was spoken earlier or the one which was spoken later on? 
The one which was spoken later on, John the Baptist doubts the ministry of Jesus. He is frustrated, right? There is never such a formula that pick the second thing the prophet spoke because the one who spoke latest is more inspired. That is not true. When you are listening to a prophet speaking, whether it is Moses, whether it is Joshua, whether it is Elijah, whoever it is, when you are hearing them talking, you should hear with your spiritual ears. To know when the prophet is speaking under inspiration and when a prophet is giving his idea and opinion. Oh, you say you are even now mentioning Elijah of the Bible. Yes, sir. Do you know there's one time Elijah in the Bible spoke a wrong thing? He wasn't right. He spoke based on his opinion. I don't have time to go into that. But he believed he was the only prophet remaining. He even mentioned it to people. But you know when he went to God? He spoke the same thing he talked to people. You know, Lord, I'm the only one remaining. <laughs> he was so sure of that, he spoke it to the people. He think he could speak it to God again. You are not the only one. The other one, 700, they've never bowed down. He was a human being. He only spoke what his limited mind could speak and what his limited mind could speak. Listen to me, saints. What you read in the scriptures are words which were carefully picked by God. But these prophets, they had their human fears. If there were tape recorders in that time, you probably would have heard a lot of other contradictory statements from Elijah. From his human side. And that is why the Bible in the book of Revelation says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit speaks. Listen, God can give me a revelation here. He can give me a revelation at home. But I will use my own verbs, my own sentences, my own examples, my own illustrations to bring forth the revelation of God. The words, the examples, the illustrations are only vehicles which carry the message. Words, syllables, punctuation marks, or words, spoken words, they are only vehicles carrying the thought of God. The vehicle can be faulty. A wheel can even be making a scrunching noise. But the inspiration is never wrong. But if you mistake the vehicle to the message, you get it wrong. The vehicle can be can be even faulty. That is why Brother Branham, his grammar was terrible. But when I'm listening to him, I don't listen to the grammar. I don't even listen to the contradictory words. I try to hear what the Spirit is speaking. That is right. Amen. Amen. So you say, oh, that man couldn't answer that question. You remember? The man didn't have an answer. He was blank. So yeah, which, which tape message do I carry? When you are hearing the prophet speak, don't pay attention to the vehicle of words, sentences. You start comparing this quote to another quote. Try to catch the mind behind the words. You never get it wrong. When you look at what Daniel prophesied here, if you compare scripture with scripture, you know that the one who ends the sacrifice here is none other than the Antichrist. Yes. Because elsewhere, the same prophecy is spoken about another Antichrist. Remember, all the visions Daniel was talking about, they were spoken in different forms with different emphasis. The prophecy about stopping the sacrifice and oblation, you find it in Daniel chapter 8 verse 11. Quickly, let us read that and then end. Of course, that was fulfilled in Antiochus 4 Epiphanes. 
as a shadow fulfillment of the real Antichrist to come. Daniel 8 verse 11 to 13. It speaks of this Antichrist. Let's start from verse, uh, verse uh, 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great, toward the south, and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Meaning, Israel. Pleasant land. This, this great man, the Antichrist. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host, and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Yeah, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. The temple, the holy temple of the Jews. The Antichrist. He ends the sacrifice and oblation. He destroys the sanctuary. Does this have any semblance with the Christ doing this? We'll speak more of that later on. Praise the Lord. But here it is sense in a summary. When the gospel goes back to the Jews. Remember everything was paused here. At the end of the 69 weeks. God pressed the pause button. In 70 AD. The temple was destroyed. Out of the picture. But Paul tells us. The gospel shall go back to the Jews. Now if God is going to deal with the Jews. The temple has to come up in the picture. Again. And that is why. A similitude of things which happened here, they have to start here again. But in a very condensed way for them to fit one week, seven years. And that is why when you read Revelation chapter 11, again you see the two anointed ones appearing here. Here it was Zechariah and Haggai, right? Here you see the two prophets with the anointing of Moses and Elijah. They come into the picture again. Revelation 11, the two anointed ones. They have the power to shut the heavens. They have the power to turn the waters. And what does it say in Revelation 11? There is an instruction for the temple to be measured. Meaning the temple is in the picture again there. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Next Sunday we shall talk about the 70th week so that we look into all the important details. Shall we stand?